Okay, welcome. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome back. Uh, let's pray first. Let's pray first. And then let's get into it. Um, I have a few things I want to chat about today first before we begin. Just kind of current events stuff. Right. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us all together to study your word, to learn what your word truly says so that we may have our filters intact and we can um, avoid all the pitfalls of those who are unstudied. Father, I'm seeing it everywhere. People just falling into pits because they refuse to actually just study your word. And I just want to pray over these people that they will just have a strong desire to get into your word, to learn what it says, to go line by line, to approach it humbly, to not preach out doctrines that they've come up with from YouTube. And I just pray, Father, that you give us stable minds as we seek your word, we seek your truth, we seek your understanding, and we seek your revelation. Father, as these days progress, we just pray for your peace. We pray that you guide us to whatever location that you want us at. We pray that you guide us into our daily activities, what we should be doing. I pray that you give us your peace and guard our eyes and ears and just give us your peace to walk humbly and meekly um, through this life that we just serve you humbly and meekly without our own agendas, without lifting ourselves up, but only lifting you up and only lifting your son up and glorifying you alone. I just pray, Father, for peace, uh, and I re just rebuke all spirits of anxiety, depression, anything that's weighing heavy on these people, any illnesses that are weighing heavily. Um, I just want to pray against arthritis and pray against, uh, pray against joint pain and aches in the joints and, and anything like that that's going on. I just want to rebuke bitterness out of everyone's joints, um, all their emotions. I just want to pray, Father, that they're able to hand them over to you and just trust you, fully trust you. Let us fully trust you in every step that we take. Let us not waver ever. Let us have eyes on Yeshua as we walk on the water in these days, Father. And I just pray, Father, for your overflowing spirit, your, your living waters to run through us, Father, and just give us a desire to have only thoughts for you, only thoughts for your kingdom, and just cleanse our minds of all confusing thoughts in Yeshua's mighty name. I just want to pray over our children, Father. I want to pray for their salvation. I want to pray that they seek you with their whole hearts. I want to pray that they have a desire to walk in your ways and your truth and a desire to be baptized and be born again. I pray, Father, over all of our children, that if they're wayward, that they come back to you, Father. I just want to call home the prodigal sons and daughters. And I pray, Father, over all of our family and friends, that they meet Yeshua in a powerful way. I pray that they, they have an encounter that they cannot deny that you speak to them and you meet them in a way that is just so bold and so clear to them that they can no longer deny uh, the choice that they have to make. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. All righty. Um, so Uh, this week, the theme of the week has seemed to be uh, I want to pray against all witchcraft, Father. I just want to pray against anybody sending witchcraft or cursing or evil eye um, against me. I pray, Father, against spirits trying to wear me out with their demonic requests and i just refuse and rebuke and just ask you to cleanse all of that put up a hedge of protection around this broadcast father and just keep all the distractions and noise away in yeshua's mighty name amen okay so this week the theme that i have been finding with people i think this is how i'm going to start every week just kind of touch on what i'm seeing is going on with people and i was offline a lot this week i needed a break from all the noise online and one of the things that I'm seeing a lot of is that people are feeding their minds with nonsense. And because they're feeding their minds with nonsense, nonsense is coming out in their life. Um, they are being stressed out. They're being confused. And it's their own fault because they're sitting on TikTok, scrolling all these different videos from people that they haven't vetted they don't know if these people are walking the walk and talking the talk, right? If you are just finding a random person online and ingesting everything that they're saying because they sound really good and they, they're able to speak with confidence and charisma and power, 
and you don't have a filter in place, you don't know what the scriptures say to filter out what they're saying, you will be deceived. 100%. You are supposed to study to show yourself approved. Okay. His people perish for lack of wisdom and understanding because they don't study the word. So what is happening is people are going to reels or TikTok or YouTube shorts, not even long form videos, and they're ingesting this short form garbage. It is eating from the pig pen, you guys. It is sitting in the pig pen and eating nonsense um, instead of sitting down, going line by line and studying the word. And I think I've gone over this a couple of times in the past few weeks because it is so important. The number one thing I see is people they are having a lack of faith. They're wavering, they're confused. And the reason that this is happening is because they're ingesting pig pen food, okay? This is why we sit here for three hours every Sabbath and then I send you to Sheepdog every Sabbath to make sure that you're getting fed properly, to make sure that you're going line by line and reading, okay? Not just somebody spewing theology at you and saying, oh, this is, you know, this means this and this, this, but go through line by line and check what things say, right? Check what they say. Uh, it is so important because if you're ingesting all this short form confusion content from people you haven't really vetted, and by vetted, I mean, you don't know if they actually know that the word, a lot of these people are repeating things that they saw on YouTube. They're repeating calendars that they saw on YouTube. They're repeating doctrine that they saw on YouTube. They're repeating um, ideas that they saw on YouTube. They did not have these revelations from sitting here with the scriptures, praying, fasting, asking Abba to show them truth. They did not have a revelation from the father. They watched a YouTube video. They thought it sounded really good. And now they're regurgitating it to you. And then you're ingesting that garbage, right? You're ingesting the pig food. And then some of you are going out and making your own video and confusing more people right? That revelation didn't come from above. It came from YouTube, right? And we have to know how to spot the difference between someone who knows the scriptures, who is spending time in the scriptures, who is humble and seeking the truth and is willing to admit that they don't have it all figured out. And people who are just spewing garbage to get likes and views and who are not testing what they're hearing through the scriptures. Okay, so we should all be going through line by line first. And then when somebody comes to you with this idea, like people send me these random videos all the time, what do you think of this? And a lot of times these videos sound really, really good. And the person, and you're like, yeah, there's a little bit of truth in that, but it's four truths and a lie. There's always four truths and a lie. So what the enemy does is the enemy, just like in the garden, will take a little bit of what Yah has said and slip a lie in there, slip a couple lies in there and twist it. And if you don't know what the scriptures actually say, and you're trying to learn the scriptures through short form TikToks or short -term form YouTube videos, you're not able to filter that. You don't know, you don't know what the scriptures say. So you can't filter who's feeding you real food and who's feeding you pig's food. Okay. And that's why we have to do this. And so if you are having um, confusion in your faith, you're feeling insecure in your faith. You're feeling confused in your faith. I would suggest that it's likely because you're ingesting garbage. You're ingesting garbage instead of ingesting the word of God. Okay. So we renew our minds. We renew our minds with the washing of the, the word. Okay. So by learning the word that will renew our minds and that will give you a steady place to filter everything else from, to filter what you're listening to, to filter what you're looking at, to what you're learning from, you will have a good filter in place, okay? Very, very, very important because there's a lot of very strange doctrines going out and these people that are presenting them are making them sound really, really good. They're making them sound like, there's one that got sent to me yesterday. I'm like, he sounds really confident and he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And if I didn't have the scripture background that I have, I, I would definitely been convinced by what he was saying. And there's a lot of this going around. Okay. These people are very convincing and they sound good. They sound biblical, but they're twisting just a little bit to get you off the game. Okay. This is really important in this time, really important in this time. We've got to stay on guard. 
you're far better off to sit there and read the scriptures, even if you don't understand, you're far better off than to scroll and try to find random videos for people you don't know. The other thing is, is a lot of times you're watching people, you don't know their walk. You don't know if they're living, they're, they're walking the talk, right? You have to kind of get to know somebody before you know what they're really about, right? And so some of these people who sound really, really good, there's one guy I'm thinking of, and he sounds really, really good. Um, but he, his life is an absolute mess behind the scenes. And I just happened to know this because Abba made sure I knew it so that I could warn people to not be led astray by him. And so this is the thing. People are real, people who can speak well and are very charismatic can sell you stuff, right? They can sell you doctrine. But if you don't know that they're they're actually walking the talk and trying to walk the best they can and, and living out the commandments, if you don't know that about them, because you're just seeing them for the first time, just don't just be just be more cautious of what you ingest, is all I'm saying. Okay. I think I, I think I went through this last time, but it's really important. The number one thing I, I have is people coming to me and they're like, I'm confused. My faith, my faith is wavering. And, and the reason a lot of people's faiths are wavering, faith is wavering is because they're not spending the time studying line by line and walking through it. And sometimes when your faith is wavering, that's a good thing because he's challenging you. He's challenging you to dig deeper. He's challenging you to trust him. If you're not hearing his voice and you don't feel like he's giving you direction, he's challenging you to trust him for the next step. He's challenging you to stay with him and wait on him even when you don't see the next piece of the puzzle that you're supposed to do, right? That is a test that he does, right? That is a test is part of what he does to show us and to show us approved. Because if we know that we can wait on him, even though he's not directing our steps every single day in a very clear way, and we just keep his commandments, we just do the right thing. If we know that and we're walking in faith in that way, we know that we are faithful to him, right? He wants to know, he, well, he does know what we're gonna do, obviously, because he knows all things, but he also wants us to see that even when it's hard and even we don't, when we don't hear his voice and even when he seems far off, we still trust in him, right? I was told yesterday, I was told last time that the broadcast wasn't working really well and we were cutting out. If that happens, um, I can't read the comments while I go. Hmm, I'm wondering how I'll try to, I'll try to watch the comments a little bit more. It's just hard because I get too distracted and I can't stay on topic. Now I've lost the pinned comment. Do, do, do. There it is. Okay, so note these verses. And if somebody else can pin those from time to time, one of the moderators, that would be helpful um, so that I can watch the comments a little bit more. If there's any problems or errors, if you're in the chat in Zoom, maybe you could message me if there's any glitches. I just, I can't tell from my end. Okay, so today we are in a more and it's all about the priesthood and there's some very interesting revelations here for us to understand. I'm gonna be careful to not add too much of my opinion uh, on this. Let's start, we're at Leviticus 21 verse one. And the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, no one shall make himself unclean for the dead among his people, except for his closest relatives, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, or his virgin sister, who is near to him because she has had no husband. For her, he may make himself unclean. He shall not make himself unclean as a husband among his people and so profane himself. They shall not make bald patches on their heads nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts on their body. 
They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they offer the Lord's food offerings, the bread of their God. Therefore they shall be holy. They shall not marry a prostitute or a woman who has been defiled. Neither shall they marry a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to his God. You shall sanctify him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. And the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by whoring, profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. The priest who... Okay. So, so I just, this is why I don't read the comments because I get so distracted. Okay. There was somebody sending in the comments, like, how do you know, how are you going to know if somebody on the internet is walking the walk or talking the talk? Um, you can sense that out over time. Um, there's a lot of people who I only know on the internet that know me fairly well at this point. Um, and, and they know that I, I, as to the best of my ability, walk the walk as best as I can. One thing that I noticed is if you watch somebody long enough, um, different things might come out and you will start to see the cracks in the veneer. Uh, the other thing, the other thing is you can pray and ask Abba to reveal to you. If there's somebody that you've kind of been following or walking with for a while, nobody's perfect. People are going to have slip ups, of course, but, it, but ask Abba to reveal. The big thing is, is are they, are they glorifying him and showing and, and turning you always back to his word to learn his word? Or are they trying to more glorify their own story, their own self and all that more so than pointing you to his word, right? So just pray for discernment on it. Um, okay, so we're talking about the holiness of the priests in the Levitical temple. So we're talking about the temple system and how the priests who worked in the temple had to be cleaner um, in, in regards to their behavior, um, their choices in their marriages and all of this stuff, they had to be more cautious and more careful. And the reason for this is, is because they were the ones feeding the bread. Okay. So think about bread as the word. Okay. Bread is a symbol for the word throughout the scripture. They are the ones that are feeding the bread. Actually, this is right on point with what we were talking about today, right? Watch who your priests are. The priests are the ones who are bringing you the bread of God. They're bringing you the word of God, right? So they are held to a higher standard. They're held to, if you had a priest in your church or wherever, your synagogue, whatever you're doing, if you had a priest or someone who was at the top, a leader, right? I, I'm not one that believes that we should re really be making, you know, call no man rabbi, call no man father. We, we can have leaders, of course. We should have leaders and, and people that help us and lead us. But we want to make sure that those people are also allowing for feedback, right? Allowing for interchange of feedback so that they're held accountable as well. Those people who are feeding you the bread of the word, who are, are talking to you about the, the bread of the word, they are held to a higher standard um, because also you're looking to them to see that they walk the walk and talk the talk. That is why they're held to the higher standard, right? When Yeshua says, you, you know, you are whitewashed tombs. So inside, they had just nastiness inside of them, but they were trying to look all holy on the outside, right? They, they were saying holy things. They were speaking in holy ways. They were doing all these rituals and stuff like that. But inside their hearts, they were actually really ugly, right? So when we look at, when we look at who we're listening to, um, we know that they're held to a higher standard. I'll just give you some examples of how, what you, you know, what standards, you know, if you had a leader who was going through divorce after divorce and remarriage after remarriage, that might be a red flag to you that that person has something going on in the inside still that they have to sort out. Right. Or if they're a glutton or a drunkard, or they swear a lot, or they they don't watch their words. Okay, so whatever 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 is in your heart comes out your mouth. So if somebody is speaking horrible things out their mouth all the time, bad words and gossip and lashon hara, that's a sign of what's in their heart. That's a sign that their heart might be bad, right? Or speaking against Yah's commandments, that might be a sign that their heart is bad, right? So the people that you're consuming the bread from. 
that are sharing the bread of God with you, breaking bread with you, you want to make sure that they are holding themselves to a higher standard, right? And that's a lot of what this is about. But this is about the exact temple system, okay? So what's interesting here as well is that the there's a couple things that we can unpack here. They shall be holy unto Yah and not profane his name, the name of their, their uh, Elohim. For they offer Yehovah's foods offer food offerings, the bread of Yehovah. Therefore, they shall be holy. This is also interesting because this is where we start to see a lot of the extra Talmudic commands come in that Yeshua addresses in the New Testament. So when Yeshua is talking about washing of the hands to make the bread, to make the the hands clean to eat the bread because the bread is holy food. This is an example of rabbinical Talmud, Talmud type Judaism, Orthodox oral tradition that had started to creep into the synagogues. Okay. So they were taking commands and things that the priesthood were doing to become more holy. And then they were projecting those onto the people. So now you cannot eat bread with unwashed hands. Okay, and let's just do the unwashed hand ritual. I'll show you it. I think there's a video, it's probably a video. Yeah. So this is really important because a lot of Christians read, you know, that verse where Yeshua talks about um, all foods are clean, which the original text does not actually say uh, that was added by scribes later. But he was actually talking about hand washing rituals and how these these hand washing rituals are not commands in the Torah. They, they were rabbinical additions, ritualistic rabbinical additions. OK. Catholicism also has many of these similar style traditions, okay? These are the traditions of men. We have to be able to separate what the traditions of men are and the added commands of men are versus the commands of Yah, right? And the only way that you're ever going to be able to separate that is exactly what I said before, is you have to learn the commands and then you will be able to know, oh, washing your hands in a special way wasn't a command in the Torah, right? It was never a command in the Torah, and therefore, welcome to the Fire Bethel Emmeth Connor. Therefore, because it's not a command in the Torah, it's a tradition of men. It's these added on rabbinical traditions. Okay, so let's just, I just want to show you so you can understand the intricacy of these traditions, because I know not a lot of Christians are aware of this stuff. Congregation for our discussion of how to wash our hands for bread. If a person's gonna be having bread, then they need to wash their hands. Now, if they're having less than a, a egg's worth, in other words, if you're having less than, let's say, two pieces of bread, you should probably wash without a bracha. If you're having, uh, if, you're, if you're gonna wash, so you, uh, and you're gonna make a bracha, then you should have a significant amount of bread, as an egg's worth uh, of bread. If your ring has a stone in it, in it, then you definitely need to remove it. Now, as we, this, as we demonstrate, I will be talking. Of course, usually you don't talk when you wash your hands. It's particularly important not to talk from the time you begin the washing until the blessing is made. Never do we interrupt between a mitzvah and its blessing. Let's say you blow the shofar, and then you, if you make a bracha before the blowing of the shofar, you never interrupt in between those two things. Afterwards, it's also important not to interrupt between the washing. And None the of the these are commands in Torah, by the way, you guys. Well, the main thing is not to interrupt between the washing and the making of the blessing. Should you interrupt at that point, that could be a serious problem. You, by mistake, you talk after you wash your hands. As long as you haven't totally removed your, your mind from the idea of washing and remaining pure, then you do not need to recite the blessing again. So if we want to put the water on our hands. We want it to cover all the way from our wrist all the way to the very ends of the fingertips. In order to do that, we're going to need a significant amount of water. So it's good to fill up a nice big cup. Try to use a small cup. This is going to be very difficult uh, to do. If you're in a shortage of water, you can follow a more lenient position of covering just simply up to the knuckles. So we do it as follows. You hold the hand this way so that everything is exposed. Your hand is totally exposed to the water. And you pour it twice. Is completely covered with water. And we would take the towel, hold our hands up, 
And then we dry the hand. We do not make a blessing while you're drying your hands. That wouldn't be proper. You should focus on the blessing. You shouldn't make a blessing uh, after you dry your hands, because then it's completely over. Rather, you should make the blessing before you dry your hands. But also try to hold the hands up so that if there's any water, it falls down on your wrist and not the other way around. The water from your above your wrist is impure, and you wouldn't want it to fall below the wrist and then to fall uh, uh, on top of the wrist. That would be improper. So we want to keep the hands up when we're drying our hands. To dry them, you remain silent, and that, then you've accomplished the washing of the hands. This idea, we have an opportunity before we bread of washing our hands, is really simple. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some more insight into what Yeshua was talking about. None of that, none of that is a command in the Torah, okay? In the scriptures, in, in the Torah, none of that is a command that we are to do. Um, that is a ritual that you know the rabbis instituted okay and we're going to get into kind of the different trajectory of the rabbis and the different schools later as we go through this okay so yes the rabbis or yes the priesthood was to be held to a higher standard they were to be more careful in who they married and and things like that and to be more sanctified more set apart and yeshua talks about how he was very sanctified as well if we go to john Let's just go quickly to John 17. Talks about uh, his sanctification. I'm gonna, I don't like to cut his words short. So we're going to start at John 17, 6. I have manifested your name, Jehovah's name, right, to the people, meaning he has brought forth Jehovah's name not diminished it, not, he's not separated from the father. He is coming in the father's name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours, they were, and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, not separate from the father. For I have given them the words that you gave me and they have received them and have come to know the truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I am not praying for the world. He doesn't care about the world. He cares about his people. All mine are yours and yours are mine. I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world and they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy father, keep them in your name. Keep them in your name, the father's name, keep them in your name, which you have given me that I, that they may be one, even as we are one. So they're not, they're not, they're one unified kingdom. Okay. So Yeshua doesn't have different, Yeshua doesn't have different commandments than his father. He doesn't have a different doctrine than his father. He just came to fully preach it, to make it more full, to give us a deeper spiritual understanding, okay? And to reunite us to the father, right? While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son, except the son of destruction so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world sanctify them in your truth your word is truth as you sent me into the world so i have sent them into the world and for their sake i consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth this is the same picture that we're seeing in leviticus where yeshua is consecrating himself at an even deeper level to feed us bread to show us the truth, right? So as he consecrates himself more in truth, more truth is revealed to us, okay? So what the, what the priesthood is an example of is as they were sanctifying themselves more in truth and consecrating themselves more in the truth, 
people could see that and look and look at that and be like, oh, I understand at a deeper level because they're witnessing it before them. So just as Yeshua comes and he shows us the truth of the word and how to walk out the commands, right? He says, don't just don't just not lust in with your eyes um, and don't like go, do adultery physically. He said, don't even do it in your mind. Don't even do adultery in your mind, right? He's preaching it at a next level. And he's showing us how that's to be done at a next level at a fuller meaning, right? He's consecrating himself so that we know what's possible, that we know what we know. But as you say, be perfect, be perfect and complete as I am perfect and complete, right? So we know what's possible. Walk as he walked, right? So we know how we can do that, right? By consecrating himself and showing how to walk out perfectly Yah's commands, we have an example that we can follow. We have our, our small human minds have a visual, an example of what that looks like, right? Not in the legalistic washing of hands, but in the internal washing of the heart. If you want to go back and understand the washing of the hands and what Yeshua was talking about with the bread, you could reread that. Uh, let me just find you the verse. Uh, Mark 7, 19. Let's just go through it so that we have... We could just make sure that thought is complete for people. Mark 7. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, uh, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Didn't do the ritual. Okay. That's ritual is not in scripture. We covered that. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, according to the tradition, not the law of God, tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and cop copper vessels and dining couches. Yeah, let's cover this just quickly. Because we're going to talk a lot about a lot about Phariseeism and Sadduceeism today. So in Orthodox Judaism, if you go to a synagogue, and I'm talking about really, uh, really Orthodox Judaism, if you go to a traditional synagogue, they have a living water bath there, not just for your body, but for your dishes. So if you go to the store and you buy a new dish, a new pot or pan, and you uh, uh, and you want to take that home and use it, you go to the synagogue and you dip your dish in the water the mikvah for the dishes in the synagogue and then at that point you can bring it home rewash it because that water isn't it's living water it's not it's not sanitized water and you bring that dish home and then you can use the dish and then it's considered kosher okay again that is not a torah commandment it is not written in the torah to do that right so these are the differences between the traditions and the commands. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophes prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, don't get all Haiti on Judah about this because Christianity does this as well. We all know that. Okay. There's, there's just different, different commandments of men, right? Sunday, Sunday, Sabbath commandment of men, Xmas commandment of men, you know, just different, different doctrines on the other side. You leave the commandment of God. You leave the commandment of God what's written in the Torah, what's written in the scriptures, and hold to the tradition of men, right? And then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Christmas, Easter, Sunday, pork, all of that. For Moshe said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles the father and mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells, tells his father and mother, 
whatever you have gained from me is korban that is given to God, then you shall no longer permit him to do everything to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down and many such things you do. So he's just talking about how they would steal money from their parents by calling it Korban and then bringing it to the temple. But really they were just bringing it onto themselves. Okay. Uh, which is interesting because I feel like the Christian church does this a lot with their tithes and offerings. They say, oh, you're giving it to God, and, and but they're not actually using it for the purposes of God. They're buying jets or they're bu building mega churches with whatever in them. It's the same principle, right? Trying to get all the, the gains in and say, oh, it's for God, using his name in vain, right? And then um, using that for their own enjoyment. And he called to the, they called the people to him again and said, hear me all of you and understand there's nothing outside of a person by going into him that can defile him but the things that come out of a person are what defile him okay this one is quoted to me a lot whenever we talk about food but i just want to kind of flip the script on this a little bit and try to understand it at a deeper level yes if you accidentally eat pork because you're out in a street market and you didn't know that there was pork in something and you ate it and you didn't realize that's not going to defile you you were covered by the blood of Yeshua in that circumstance. But that doesn't mean that you have a rebellious heart because it's the things that are in your heart that come out. That rebellious heart is what's going to defile you. So if you say, oh, I don't care what I eat because it doesn't matter. God's commandments don't matter. I can do whatever I want. God's commandments don't matter. That's a defilement in your heart that's coming out of you. Okay. Okay. So quoting this verse at somebody saying that this means you can eat pork is a defilement coming out of you. It is showing that your heart is in the wrong place. It is showing you that you do not fear Elohim, that you do not respect the way that he created the world, that you do not respect his commandments, that you show no reverence to him. That is what's coming out of your heart when you use this verse as a way to tell people to eat whatever they want, right? obviously he didn't he was he was speaking of a spiritual thing because if you go to the farmer's field today and eat caca off the ground that would still be disgusting right would it not or it does it not defile you anymore right so use your brain right it, it's about the spiritual it's the spiritual picture of what's going on so rebellion against yah rebellion against his commands is a defilement coming out of your heart it is defiling you to be so rebellious and to speak so boldly against his commands, right? Without considering that maybe that's a bit off, right? And you have entered the house and left the people. And, as, and then he had entered the house and left the people. The disciples asked him about this parable. And he said, then are you without, with underst are you without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart and his stomach, but is expelled. So this, this right here, K, I don't know if you guys can see it on your, uh, okay. It's not showing up. It's not showing on here. So where it says, thus he made all foods clean. You know how that's in brackets. It's in brackets because it was not in the original manuscripts. Okay. That was added by scribes later. That is important to know. Beware of the scribes, right? Okay, I think we covered that. So the context of what he was talking about, the context of what he was talking about is washing hands. It wasn't about pork. It's not about making, you know, things that Abba called not food into food. He's talking about holiness rituals that were added on over the years via the rabbinical traditions, okay? We gotta keep, we have to keep things in context and not add in context where it's not relevant. Back to Leviticus, let's go to verse 10, 21, 10 was chief among his brothers on whose head the anointing oil is poured and who has been consecrated to wear the garments shall not let the hair of his head hang loose nor tear his clothes he shall not go into any dead bodies nor make himself unclean 
even for his father or for his mother. He shall not go out of the sanctuary, lest he profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is on him. I am the Lord. And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman, or a woman who has been defiled, or a prostitute, these he shall not marry. But he shall take as his wife a virgin of his own people, that he may not profane his offspring among his people. For I am the Lord who sanctifies him. This is for the high priest, the priest who is chief among his brothers. So the priest, the high priest had the highest of standard, okay? And I find this very interesting because you see this parallel in Revelation where the 144,000 are maidens, right? And we have the, the parable of the wise and foolish maidens. And that is a depiction of the bride of Messiah. And who's our high priest? Messiah is a high priest. So this shadow picture of the high priest only marrying a maiden who has made herself pure, who has filled her lamp with oil, right? Just that picture goes throughout scripture. So it's a really interesting shadow picture. And also for those who are worried because they're not a virgin, um, it's a spiritual understanding, right? You're, you've made yourself pure. You've kept yourself for your um for Mashiach, for that spiritual understanding, right? So it means you're not going after other gods. You're not you're go not going after the commandments of other gods. Uh, you're not defiling yourself self in those ways. You're keeping yourself pure. You're keeping your lamp full of oil, and you're waiting for him to arrive so that you can join with him at the wedding feast. Okay, right? these are all metaphorical, prophetic pictures. So you have the literal, the very temple understanding, and then you have the, the prophetic future understanding. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron saying, none of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near a man blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long, or a man who has an injured foot or an injured hand or a hunchback, or a dwarf, or a man with a defect in his sight, or an itching disease, or scabs, or crushed testicles. No man of the offspring of Aaron the priest who has a blemish shall come near to offer the Lord's food offerings. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy things, but he shall not go through the veil or approach the altar, because he has a blemish that he may not profane my sanctuaries, for I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So Moses spoke to Aaron and to his sons and to all the people of Israel. And the Lord... This is an important uh, verse to note when you look at Isaiah 56. So Isaiah 56 is a future prophecy about all the people being ingathered to Mount Zion. And the eunuchs are there. Right. So what what is a eunuch? I I pray you guys know a eunuch has been castrated for service to the king. So a eunuch would not be able to enter the courts. Right. They would not be able to join the priesthood. They would not be able to enter in in that way. And so what is the picture here? This is the earthly temple. But as we move to the the greater revelation of all of this, is that all of those will be gathered in all of those who are going to walk in his truth, keep his Sabbath, uh, glorify his name, even if they have scabs or crushed whatever, a hunchback or a dwarf or a man who has a defect in sight, they will be able to enter. And this is really interesting even for me because I have a defect. I'm deaf in one ear. I was born deaf in one ear. So would I have been able to enter, right? Very interesting to think about. So all of those, we will all be made new. So if you want to look at that, it's Isaiah 56. And spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son so that they abstain from the holy things of the people of Israel, which they dedicate to me 
so that they do not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. Say to them, if any one of all your offspring throughout your generations approaches the holy things that the people of Israel dedicate to the Lord while he has an uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. None of the offspring of Aaron who has a leprous disease or a discharge may eat of the holy things until he is clean. Whoever touches anything that is unclean through contact with the dead or a man who has had an omission of semen, and whoever touches a swarming thing by which he may be made unclean, or a person from whom he may take uncleanness, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who touches such a thing shall be unclean until the evening, and shall not eat of the holy things unless he has bathed his body in water. When the sun goes down, he shall be clean, and afterward he may eat of the holy things, because they are his food. He shall not eat what dies of itself or is torn by beasts, and so make himself unclean by it. I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my charge, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby when they profane it. I am the Lord who sanctifies them. This section is very interesting when you think about it in relation to a lot of the stories in the New Testament about Yeshua. So him healing the lepers and him, the woman with the issue of blood touching him and being healed. And those sort of things, whoever touches anything that is unclean through contact with a dead man or has an omission, um, whoever touches a swarming thing that has been made, uh, his, whatever his uncleanness may be, that person who touches a thing will be unclean until evening and will not eat of the holy things unless he's bathed his body in water. So it is this picture of this separation of the priesthood from, from different things, right? And so if they had some sort of discharge or a leprous disease, they weren't allowed to go and do temple duty. They had to be very, very careful with that. A lay person shall not eat of a holy thing. No foreign guest of the priest or hired servant shall eat of a holy thing. But if a priest buys a slave as his property for money, the slave may eat of it, and anyone born in his house may eat of his food. If a priest's daughter marries a layman, she shall not eat of the contribution of the holy things. But if a priest's daughter is widowed or divorced and has no child and returns to her father's house, as in her youth, she may eat of her father's food, yet no lay person shall eat of it. And if anyone eats of a holy thing unintentionally, he shall add the fifth of its value to it and give the holy thing to the priest. They shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel, which they contribute to the Lord, and so cause them to bear iniquity and guilt by eating their holy things. For I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Just a couple lines in here that might cause people to stumble. Okay, so if a priest buys a slave as his property for money, and the slave may eat of it. So the slave may eat of the holy things of the temple if the priest buys a slave. Now we have to understand what slavery means in biblical context. It's not chattel slavery where you purchase somebody and you uh, whip them into working for you. Slave in scriptures, there's, there's different outlines for it. And many of you are slaves today, right? Many of you have a boss who has paid you money to do a job for him. That is what this is, okay? So if a priest hires somebody, pays them money because that person is in debt and owes money and needs to make money so that they can get out of debt, people can hire them. It's just worded differently because it was worded back then. Uh, we went all through we went all through this when we went through the slavery commands. But the idea of when you had purchased someone to work for you, they would come live with you, you would feed them, you would take care of them. And the, the main caveat, the main thing that is spoken about when you purchase somebody to work for you because they had a debt, and usually it was because these people went into debt is why they had to um, be hired out because they didn't have their own land anymore. They didn't have a way to get ahead. And this was an opportunity for them to just live a better life, right? Just like you would go get a job, make some money, and maybe you would start a business later. It's the same idea. Okay, so that person that came to work for you, so say I go hire somebody to work to help me, I hire somebody to work in my life and help me. And they come into my home. 
they would, they, I would be required to treat them as I would treat my own sons and daughters, my own family. So they wouldn't get less food. They wouldn't get beaten. You know, they wouldn't do, you know, anything they would be treated very, very well. Okay. And that is a Torah command. Okay. So don't get triggered by words in English that you don't fully understand the context of. Okay. Um, and so what's this thing with the priest daughter? So if, so when a daughter was married, she would leave her father's house and go and live um, in her husband's house. So if she was widowed or divorced, uh, at, she would return to her father's house and he would cover her again and take care of her. And so then she would come back in and be able to eat the father's food. Right. Um, why does it say Ed has no child? Well, if she had a child that was grown like a, a like a, a son, the son would take over taking care of her and covering her. Uh, that's why Yeshua, when he was on the cross, pointed to his mother. And I think it was Peter and said, this is your mother. Like basically take care of my mother because the sons were supposed to take care of their mothers um, as the mothers aged. And if the husband died or, or something had happened to the husband, the sons were to take care of the mothers. That's why for women, it was really, really important to also have a son, um, have a son born to you because that was, that was something that would give you more security. If you had three or four sons, that would give you, and it's even the same today. It's even the same today. If you have, if you're a woman and you're getting older and your husband dies, but you have three or four sons, you're good. You know, you're, you're going to be taking care of your houses, you know, as long as you haven't treated those sons horribly, you know, they're going to come and fix stuff for you. They're going to come lift heavy things for you. Uh, so it is the same picture that we have today and same as it was then, but it was even more so then because they wouldn't have, um, the different securities that we have now in society a woman who is left without a husband or uncovered was in a very dangerous position in society back in that day so it was good for her to have many sons and so this is also a, a picture of that when it says if she you know if she has no child so if she had three sons and they were older she would stay on her own and her sons would take care of her right uh if her husband died her sons would take care of her and she would be fine. She would be absolutely okay, right? She wouldn't need to come back to her father's house. So that's what this is all about, right? Very interesting to note. I just want to point this out so that you can kind of see the thread because we do have a false priesthood that operates, right? The Roman priesthood is a false priesthood that has stepped in and usurped a lot of these things in the name of Jesus, they have come in and made themselves a priesthood and they've really twisted and done it in a funky way. So I want, in light of that, I want to point out to you uh, this last verse here in verse 16. They shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel, which they contribute to Yehovah, and so cause them to bear iniquity, perverse thinking and guilt, by eating their holy things, for I am Yehovah who sanctifies them. The things that he puts in place and the patterns and the systems that he's put in place are to show you, that's why we have to, that's why we have to be able to define um, what is holy and what is unholy, what is clean, what is unclean. We have to know those differences so that we can spot when when someone is trying to stick something in the, the scriptures that is not of Yah and there, what happens and what Rome does a lot, Rome does this a lot is they want to take the authority to sanctify away from Yehovah and put it upon themselves. So the Pope wants to have the authority to sanctify you. Oh, do what the Pope says because I am the Pope who sanctifies you, right? That's why he changes the Sabbath day. That's why he changes the commands. That's why he twists the priesthood. That is the whole picture of it. Instead of giving <clears throat> the process of sanctification to the glory of that to Yehovah, they want to steal the glory. It's like, you're doing it through me, right? <clears throat> this this sanctification is directly connected to the command to keep the Sabbath. You can see that in Exodus 20. Let's just look at it. Exodus 
Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. On the seventh day is a Sabbath uh, to Yehovah, your Elohim. On it you shall do no work, your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. In six days, Yehovah made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Yehovah blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Then Exodus 32, I think it is. <clears throat> Just Google it. Exodus 31, and Yehovah spoke to Moshe saying, uh, speak also to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbath you shall keep for it is a sign, a mark, an oath between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yehovah who sanctifies you. So why does Rome change Sabbath to take credit for sanctifying you? It's a very big deal, very big deal removing Yeshua's covering and putting their own over you. <clears throat> Very dangerous game. Okay, so verse 17, we're at Leviticus 21, 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons and all the people of Israel and say to them, when any one of the house of Israel or of the sojourners in Israel presents a burnt offering as his offering for any of their vows or free will offerings that they offer to the Lord, if it is to be accepted for you, it shall be a male without blemish of the bulls or the sheep or the goats. You shall not offer anything that has a blemish, for it will not be acceptable for you. And when anyone offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering from the herd or from the flock, to be accepted, it must be perfect. There shall be no blemish in it. Animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. You may present a bull or a lamb that has a part too long or too short for a free will offering, but for a vow offering, it cannot be accepted. Any animal that has its testicles bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall not offer to the Lord. You shall not do it within your land. Neither shall you offer as the bread of your God any such animals gotten from a foreigner. Since there is a blemish in them because of their mutilation, they will not be accepted for you. Um, a couple of things, <clears throat> a couple of things to note here uh, to bring to bring animals that are perfect without blemish. So with a blemish to Yehovah. What happened later on in the scriptures is we see that the people are bringing blemished animals as offerings for their vows and their sin offerings and all of that to <clears throat> the temple. And what they were doing in that process is they were not giving their best. They were giving almost their, their leftovers or what couldn't be sold. So an animal would be very valuable. It'd be like cash or currency. And instead of bringing the first and the best, they were bringing the last and the weakest. Uh, and it was unacceptable. And it showed their heart position, right? It's And it's just like in today's understanding, it would show our heart position. If we're always giving Yehovah, you know, the last of our time, the last of our energy, we're giving something else. Perhaps we're waking up and scrolling our phone, guilty, uh, first in the morning rather than worship and praying and spending time with him reading his word. Perhaps we are doing that. So we're not giving him our first and our best. We're giving him, we're using him as an afterthought. Oh, I got to remember to do this and, you know, connect with him later. I as something that we could implement in today's in this week's study. I would suggest thinking about where you're giving him your leftovers instead of your best and your first. Okay. Whether that be in your offerings and how you share your resources and steward your resources, or whether that be in your time 
you know, what time are, are you giving him the first and the best of your time? Are you giving him, you know, your first fruits in the morning, right? Or are you forgetting about him and scrolling and getting distracted, right? Consider, consider revising that and getting into better habits in that way. And that will help you with a lot of other things in your life as well. It will give you a lot more clarity and a lot more peace in your life to put him first, obviously. So as a free will offering, they were allowed to bring blemished animals, but not as a vow offering. The other thing to note, which is really interesting if you know anything about farming is the uh, the animals could not be fixed, castrated. Um, those animals, they were not supposed to castrate any of the animals in the land. So therefore, any of you that have worked with animals know how difficult that makes farming. So you would have to probably sacrifice because you'd, you'd only want one male usually in a in a herd. So you would have to, any of the males born, you would probably take them very young to sacrifice them before that they, before they came into season, if you know what I'm saying. Just interesting to note that they were not supposed to do that in the land. Any animal, uh, any animal that has its testicles bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall not offer to Yehovah and you shall not do that within your land. So you should not crush or bruise or do anything to the animals in your land so just something to note this is a reason why that you don't find many jewish farmers because if they want to keep torah it's very hard for them to be a farmer right uh neither shall you offer the bread of yehovah in any way in Neither, neither shall you offer as the bread of Yehovah any such animal that has gotten from a foreigner, since there is a blemish in them because of their mutilation. So this is where it's clarified. Uh, Yehovah spoke to Moshe saying, when an ox or sheep or goat is born, it shall remain seven days with its mother. And from the eighth day, it shall be acceptable as a food offering to Yehovah. So it sounds as though if they had a male animal, there's a really good chance if they already had a male and they didn't want two males, they would take that on the eighth day as a food offering to Yehovah, to the temple. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when an ox or sheep or goat is born, it shall remain seven days with its mother. And from the eighth day on, it shall be acceptable as a food offering to the Lord. But you shall not kill an ox or a sheep and her young in one day. And when you sacrifice a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, you shall sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten on the same day. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. We talked about Thanksgiving offerings before. So Thanksgiving offerings were not, it's not about, so a lot of people, especially in the Christian understanding, they think a lot of these things are about sin all the time. A Thanksgiving offering was not about sin. It was about, you've had an increase, you're grateful, whatever reason that you're grateful, you want to celebrate. So you would bring a sacrifice to the temple and you would invite all your friends to come. And basically you would have a big barbecue. Okay. And you were having a time of worship and blessing and feeding and many people would eat and be fed. And this, this is why none of it would be left. It would be eaten on the same day and none of it left to the morning because you were supposed to. So say you have a whole, a whole animal, a whole sheep that you have. to. So if you're not going to eat it all, you're going to be able to eat it all in one day. You're going to want to invite other people. So it's a community thing. So you're doing the, the Thanksgiving praise together, the Thanksgiving offering and praise together, which is really, really beautiful. So it's like a big barbecue. And that's why, because you only had one day, you have to, you would have to invite other people to join in with you in your Thanksgiving offering. What's the spiritual picture? You you share you share with your others. You share the blessings with others, community. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord, and you shall not profane my holy name. 
that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year old without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hin. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. I want to stop there. We've gone through the spring feasts many, many times. So I don't want to dwell on those. If you want more information, I have a book link in my bio that you can download. Also, just look at the past studies and you can go through the, 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 the spring feasts, the Passover and um, unleavened bread. And then first fruits, which is already passed. Right now we are in the Feast of Weeks. We're in the midst of the Feast of Weeks. So I am going to cover, we're going to read through the Feast of Weeks and I am going to cover that more in depth today so that you have a good understanding of the season that we're in right now. Feast of Weeks connects Passover to Shavuot. Shavuot is also Pentecost. It's the same day as Pentecost, okay? So when Yeshua told the, told the disciples to wait in the upper room, until the spirit came, that was the feast of Shavuot. So there was the first feast of Shavuot where the, we were given the 10 commandments. Moshe gave the commandments at Mount Sinai on the feast of Shavuot. Many, many years later on the feast of Pentecost, Penti means 50. So 50 days after first fruits is Shavuot or Pentecost, right? It's called Pentecost in Greek because we count to 50. That's where the name comes from, okay? So it's just Greek versus Hebrew. Hebrew Shavuot, Greek Pentecost. Same day, exact same day. When the disciples were in the upper room and waiting for the spirit to come and the spirit fell upon them, that is on the same feast day as the commandments were given. And so we know that the new covenant, the renewed covenant, is the commandments written on our heart through the spirit, right? Not done away with, but written on our heart. So the new tablets are the tablets of our heart, okay? Let's learn about the Feast of Weeks, which we are in now. We're about halfway through the Feast of Weeks now. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offerings. 
and the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord, your God. Okay, so the first you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, uh, the Sabbath during Passover. So once there's a Sabbath during Passover, so you have the Passover high holy Sabbath, the first one, and then you have the regular Sabbath. So you should count seven full weeks from the day after that Sabbath, 50 days. This verse alone proves that lunar Sabbath is not true. I'm going to stand behind that. You guys, if you're on this lunar Sabbath train, you need to study more. You cannot in any fathomable way do lunar Sabbath and fulfill this mitzvot at the same time, because you cannot get seven weeks and 50 days and seven Sabbaths while you are doing lunar Sabbath. You might get 53 days because you have your extra new moon days. You might get, and I'm sure you, I'm sure there's doctrine that they've manipulated to come around this, but this verse alone proves that lunar Sabbath is incredibly fishy, incredibly fishy. I have other reasons why lunar Sabbath is incredibly fishy, but this verse alone, pray on it, seek you out on it. If you have been led to lunar Sabbath, start counting and, sh and show me how it works. Show me how you get seven weeks, 50 days and seven Sabbaths. Show me, please. Because this verse speaks against you and what you're saying. And I understand that it lines up in it li lines up at the Exodus, but it doesn't line up with this. The other reason that I do not agree with lunar Sabbath, the other reason is the fact that all the languages of the world, miraculously, they all speak to the seventh day, Saturday Sabbath. If you look up every single language and look up the history of every language and go back in time and look up the history, you will see that. So I have a Brazilian student staying with me right now. She's, she's Catholic actually. Um, and so I've been teaching her about the Sabbath and talking to her about the Sabbath. And I said, how do you say Saturday in Portuguese? Cause they speak Portuguese in Brazil. It's Sabado, the Sabbath, Sabado. So all of these languages, if you go back in time, probably I would assume till the, till the day of, till the Tower of Babel, all of these languages say Sabbath, right? Don't you think that if the Sabbath is the sign that Yehovah sanctifies you, that he would be very careful to make it not confusing and that we wouldn't be confused and that he would give us a clear picture. If, if that is the one sign that he's the one that sanctifies you. Wouldn't he want that sign preached throughout the world, right? So I, you know, feel free to disagree with me and show me how, feel free to inbox me and show me how the 50 days, seven Sabbaths and seven full weeks works with a lunar Sabbath. Um, generally you get 53 days or something like that. Please feel free to convince me of that. I'm open to being convinced, but at this moment in time, I am definitely not convinced. Okay. The other problem I have with the lunar Sabbath, I'll just clear this up now too, is there's a very clear command to work six, rest one, work six, rest one. You have to twist and manipulate that command to do lunar Sabbath and you have to navigate that and you kind of have to like tweak and push. And it's really pushing based on pushing based on coincidences in the text that actually line up with feasts anyways. So the, the moment in Joshua, so a lot of times they use this, this, this moment in Joshua where Joshua enters the land, Joshua enters the land on Passover. So it's already going to line up with the moon because it's Passover. And that we, we see that in Joshua, I think it's seven. So we know that that time that Joshua was entering the land was Passover anyways. Passover is reckoned to the moon anyways. So a lot of these coincidences for me, 
it's just not convincing. I'm sorry. It's just, I haven't been convinced. I've, I've looked at this for about three years. It's been, it comes up every year. I look at it again. I'm always willing to look at it again, but I failed to be convinced for three years straight. So, and I have fasted and I've prayed and I've sought him on it. Um, in a, it, for about six months straight, I fasted and prayed and I went through and I have yet to be convinced. So please send me your convincing information. I am open to it. Um, I'm always open to being corrected, but at this point, I just want to point out this scripture to anyone and just show me how it works, please. All right, moving on, we're going to go to, oh yes, I want to talk to you about the two tenths of an ephah. So I had this recipe and I went, I have a good challah recipe and I went through it and I decided to figure out what two tenths of an ephah were and do the math and convert the recipe to see how big these loaves of bread would be. So one, one loaf of bread would be, I think it was like 20, I, I'm going off memory here, but I think it was like 20 cups of flour, 17 egg yolks. Like it was giant. Um, I don't know how you would bake that evenly and make it turn out nice, but they were, they're giant loaves of bread. And so what is the picture of the giant loaf of bread? We have the Passover where we remove the leaven, right? We remove the false doctrine. We remove, and this goes back to, we're talking this, this goes back because we we're talking about priests and the priests are free feeding you the bread, right? So the, as the priests are feeding the bread, they're consecrating themselves to make sure that as they touch the bread and they're feeding you the bread, which is the word of Yah, that they are doing that with the most purest intentions. They're doing that with the most unleavened intentions. That's how the priest should be feeding you the bread, okay? No ulterior motives. And so the picture of the Passover is we remove all the leaven of Egypt, remove the leaven of sin, remove the leaven of pride, and we focus on the unleavened um, priesthood of Yeshua and how he was unleavened and he had consecrated himself so, so fully so that we could see um, Yehovah through him, right? And so that's the picture of Passover. It's that, that belief and that, that crossing over in him right and then as we count the days we count the omer all the way to shavuot it's this picture of we're going to get the bread from heaven now we've gotten rid of the other bread we've gotten rid of the other things that confuse us and make us unstable and now we're going to accept the bread from heaven so in the first understanding of this we have the ten commandments two loaves ten commandments two tablets get it so we have those, we understand that from Shavuot, right? And then in the more fuller picture with Pentecost and the disciples in the upper room, we have the, the commandments been, being written on our heart. So we have that, that bread being fed to us in such a spiritual way, right? Being written on our heart, the tablets of our heart. So you can see how, you know, you have this shadow picture of the feast. And the, the reason that we have the shadow pictures and then we have the fuller picture is because our human brains need to be walked through the pictures. We need that. We need Yeshua to walk us through so that we can have that understanding. That's why he used a lot of symbols. That's why the word uses a lot of symbols that the people would understand. And we've lost touch with a lot of these symbols because of the false feasts and the false Sabbaths and all of that. But we've also lost touch with a lot of these symbols because we don't bake our own bread anymore, right? Well, we're, people are getting back into that now. It's become more of a, a kind of a trend right now, but we don't use leaven all the time. So we don't understand what leaven is and how it puffs up. And we don't, you know, we don't farm. So we don't understand you know, animals and, and the offerings and how animals are worth money. And we don't understand that, that math anymore because we live in this modern world, right? So as we study, we want to start to go back to start to learn these pictures and learn what they mean. The slavery one is a really good example of this. It's like people look at it like, like the horrible slavery that happened in America, right? They look at it like that, but that's not the picture that's being painted there. The picture of there is being is like hiring a worker to live with you, right? This worker is in debt. I'm going to hire this worker to live with me. Once their debt is paid, they're free to go. Um, but I'm going to send them on their way. You know, I'm going to give them anything they need to start life off on their own, but I'm going to treat them like family. It's a very different picture. Um, and, and sometimes when our, when we get into our new modern thinking, we just, we really lose the context. The context gets really lost. So if you were counting the over, you know, I know there's a lot of different calendars that people do. Um, 
you just count each day from 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 the first Sabbath after Passover. You just count 50 days. So it always lands on the day after Sabbath. And so you have the 50 days and then you have the seven weeks, right? Let's go into the Feast of Trumpets. I'm not going to go in depth into Trumpets, Atonement, and Booths, because obviously in the fall, we will be talking a lot more about this. If you want a breakdown and learn more about these fall feasts and you want to get a head start, again, I have a download um, on my link in bio, so you can just download that. Uh, we won't get too much into it today because we have to get into Ezekiel today. We'll just read through it. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, shall you keep your Sabbath. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days, is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation, for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day besides the Lord's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of the Lord. So are they Jewish feasts? No. Thus Moshe declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of Yehovah. They're Yeho Yehovah's feasts. Important to remember. Because people will come to you and they'll say, those are Jewish things. No, they're Yehovah's things, right? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from beaten olives for the lamp, that a light may be kept burning regularly. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tent of meeting, Aaron shall arrange it from evening to morning before the Lord regularly. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. He shall arrange the lamps on the lampstand of pure gold before the Lord regularly. Ding, 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 ding. Remember how I always tell y'all, all y'all, watch the order of things. Watch the order that he goes through things. Okay? What did we do? Acceptable offerings. Actually, we probably go through this whole thing and break it down. Holiness, priests, 
you know, knowing the holy from the profane. Yehovah is the one that sanctifies you. His Sabbaths are a sign that he's the one that sanctifies you. Yeah, got it? Following me? Okay, watch the order. Acceptable offerings. These are the things you bring him your best. You bring him the best of all you have, okay? Even if you sacrifice a Thanksgiving offering, you shall, you shall sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten in the same day. You should leave none of it till morning. I am Yehovah. Thanksgiving offerings. Yeah. Invite your friends to have a Thanksgiving offering. You shall keep my commands and do them. I am Yehovah. I am the Yehovah who sanctifies you. Okay. Then what does he go into? Feasts. Right. Goes through all the feasts. These are the different feasts. Seven feasts, seven candles on the lampstand, seven candles on the menorah, right? Seven feasts. What do the feasts do? They are Sabbaths. They sanctify you because he is Yehovah who sanctifies you. Yeah? Following me? What happens after this? Always watch the order. The order is always so precise. Lamps. Okay? We have the Feast of Booths. And they're under a tabernacle. And we have the lamps right after that, okay? What happens to Laodicea? They're told that they need to buy gold refined by fire. What is the, what is the lamp stand made out of? Gold. Refining, fi refining fire is in the lamp stand, lighting up the temple. Lighting up the temple. Hopefully you're catching the metaphors. And Yeshua says to them, because they're lukewarm, they need to buy gold. They need to buy from him gold refined by fire. Yeah. So right after he talks about the feast, he talks, he goes into the lampstand and the bread and the tabernacle and these symbols, okay? It is all connected in this order. How do you make sure that you are a maiden who is ready in the correct season with their lamps full of oil? Jehovah is so gracious and so merciful that he gave you appointments to prepare yourself so that you're always being prepared with your lamp full of oil in the correct season with the correct refinement, right? Anyone who's walked through this, the feast several times knows that as you go through the feast, you're learning the word. He's teaching you new things about his spirit and how uh, we are to be in this world. And you are lighting your lamp. You are lighting that lamp in your window and you're burning it continually, right? When you're keeping a feast and people are seeing you keep a feast and they're seeing you bring that Thanksgiving offering, that is you lighting your lamp and putting your lamp out to shine and say, look, look what we're doing. We're, we're doing what the word says and you're shining your lamp to the people, right? You're not hiding it. You're shining it out. So the wise maidens have lamps full of oil. Does that make sense? I hope so. And then he goes into the bread, right? The bread is the bread is the picture of the word. And then it's also the picture we've got here, the picture of 12 loaves, which is perfect. 12 is perfect government, perfect order. 12 loaves is a symbol of the 12 tribes, 12 disciples, et cetera, et cetera. You shall take fine flour and bake 12 loaves from it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each loaf. And you shall set them in two piles, six in a pile, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each pile, that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion, as a food offering to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual due. Now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel. And the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp, and the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. Then they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shalometh, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, 
Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. I want to look that up in Hebrew. One second. So we're at Leviticus 22. Leviticus 22, 13. There is probably something really deep here that I am not seeing yet, but. Nope, we're at 23, I guess. 23, 24. Cursed, quell, to be slight. Be, oh, uh, wow, okay. Uh, cursed to be slight, swift, and trifling. Uh, to be slight of water, to be abated, to be swift, trifling, take of little account. Wow. This makes me think of all the different. So to curse the name of Yehovah, to be slight, to be trifling to be swift, to disregard it, um, to take it superficially or lightly, to be lightly esteemed. Think about, I mean, I can, you can go read, look at the last video I posted this week about just keeping the feasts of Yehovah and the comments on there and how trifling and slight and swift they are and how they are not reverent. Some of them are not reverent at all. And then put that in the picture of this order, okay? So this woman comes along and she's being trifling with the name. She's being swift to curse the name because she's arguing with the Israelite. That's really interesting. Okay, so I want to go back and look at that. I'm going to go back and I want to look at blaspheme. Ooh. Uh. Wow. To blaspheme the name of Yehovah. It means to pierce. He bored uh, to, to pierce a hole in it, to prick off. Pricked off. Interesting. So to blaspheme the name of Yehovah is to pierce or bore the name of it. I just want to look at another Nakab. To puncture, to puncture his name, to, to puncture, to cause violence to his name. So that is I just want to see if there's a root word. It is a root to pierce. It's a verb, obviously. Very interesting. Okay. So blaspheme is to pierce his name. So to blast his, blaspheme his name, to create a hole in his name, to pierce his name. To curse is to be swift or trifling with his name. Keep that in mind. That is good to be noted. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. 
Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death. You shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. So Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. Thus the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay, we're going to move on to Ezekiel 44. Ezekiel 44. Now, I want to caveat, just so you have some background information. There are things in Ezekiel 44 that contradict Leviticus that we just read. And I find that very, very interesting. There's also, there's also apparent contra contradictions throughout scripture, but usually when you see a contradiction, it's because there's a deeper spiritual understanding there that might, might need to be fully revealed to us still. Uh, there's different contradictions, apparent contradictions in the New Testament. But when I, whenever I look at those apparent contradictions, what I find very interesting is that there's usually a spiritual mystery and a parable within the contradiction. So that, that contradiction existing is actually pointing for you to look deeper into something and to be more prayerful and to sort it out and to wrestle with the contradiction a bit. And now an atheist would hear that and be like, yeah, right, 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 right. You know what, you know what they would say. Um, but you with spiritual eyes know that this is very much true. So for example, the differences between the different gospels, there's different reasons that there's differences in between the different gospels. And they're, they're very slight, but they're actually to point you to different spiritual understandings. We won't get into that today. As I was studying and preparing for, as I was studying and preparing for this study, as I started to read Ezekiel, I was like, well, nobody knows if Ezekiel is a physical temple that we're going to build here or if it's a if it's the the new jerusalem come down from heaven temple and as i was reading and praying about it and i was looking at it i realized that the contradictions might actually tell us if the the, the temple is a physical levitical temple or if it is a spiritual new jerusalem temple the fact that there are contradictions in Ezekiel versus Leviticus may point to that whatever temple is coming is not going to be a Levitical temple, but it's going to be the version of this temple, the Ezekiel temple. So it very well could be a temple that comes down to earth, right? And that might make more sense as we get into it, because we're going... The, the Levitical priests that are going to be used in the Ezekiel temple are the sons of Zadok alone, because the sons of Zadok kept charge over the temple matters, even when the rest of Israel was being led astray. They remained pure to the commands of Yah, even when the rest of, of Israel was being led other places. And that is why they will be rewarded with the priesthood and the priesthood duties in the Ezekiel temple. I have long been convinced that this time we are spending on earth, this, this time that we are spending together, going through the trials and tribulations that we are going through, is very much a test to see if you will be led astray into this fleshly matter, that fleshly matter, this worldly matter, that worldly matter, if you have a desire for the world, or if above all things, no matter what's going on around you, you will keep your eyes on the commandments and um, keep your eyes on walking his path alone and trusting him alone. Or are you going to be worried about this over here, worried about that over there? I truly believe that we are in this refining period to see what jobs we will have in the next in the millennial reign and the next thing that happens to see where he is going to position and keep each of us. And that is why we are put through these different tests, right? He's told us that he will test us. That's what Deuteronomy 13 is all about. When Yeshua says, what does Yeshua say? I, I, I hate trying to quote from memory because 
uh, I don't want to misquote Yeshua, obviously. So I will not quote from memory. But that's a bad translation. I don't like to quote from bad translations, and I don't like to quote from memory of a verse that I haven't fully perfected my memorization of. We're going to do NIV. Sure. We'll get it. This is NIV. Nope, we're not going to do NIV. That's a terrible. We're going to do Tree of Life. Tree of Life should be good. At the hour, uh, we're at Matthew 18. And the hour of the disciples came to Yeshua saying, who, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him in the midst of them and said, amen, I tell you, unless you turn and become like children, you shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then shall humble himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes such a child in my name welcomes, you, welcomes me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who trust in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone tied around his neck and to be sunk in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of, because of the snares. For snares must come, but woe to, woe to that man through whom the snare comes. That, so that's one of them. And then I wanted to show you the other one. This might be one of those things where it's different in each gospel too. Uh, Matthew 519. Start at 514 because that goes back into what we were just talking about, about the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. A city set on a hill. So who is New Jerusalem? Philadelphia. Philadelphia is given the name, their pillars in New Jerusalem. You are the light of the world. A city, New Jerusalem, set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket or on a stand. It gives light to all the house who's the house all the people in the same way let your light shine before others so that you they may see your good works so you got to do good works because you got to let your light shine to do good works so works are needed and what do works do they give glory to the father who is in heaven so we do good works to give glory to the father in who is in heaven not to be saved not for salvation we do it to give glory to the father who is in heaven Laodicea, they need to buy gold refined by fire. They don't have a lampstand. Their lampstand is out of order. Uh, Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish. What does abolish mean? Abolish means to destroy, dis demolish, overthrow, or throw down. Do not think that I have come to destroy, demolish, overthrow, or throw down the commandments. I have not come to ab abolish them, but to fulfill them. Make full, fill up. Polero, make full, fill up, make them full. Okay. So instead of not just adult, just don't adulter, you don't even adulter in your mind. Instead of an eye for an eye, you turn the other cheek and you forgive fully and you, and you don't do eye for an eye. Right. So not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of not, not doing these things even in your heart and your mind. Don't even murder in your heart and your mind, right? Don't even lust in your heart and your mind. Full, fill. Make full, fill up. Okay? So he didn't come to destroy or abolish. 
or destroy the commandments or the law of the prophets, but to fully preach, make them full. Um, Jim was talking the other day. If you don't know Jim, he's on here. He's talking the other day about how he was talking to a Greek man and uh, Plero in Greek, the way that they describe it is if you had a cup that was, you still had a cup, right? And it was half full of water. If you were going to Polero the water, you would fill the cup to the brim. You still had the cup and you still had the water, but you were going to fill the cup to the brim. So you're going to Polero it. You were going to fulfill it, make it full. Okay. For truly, I understand to you until heaven and earth pass away. Hasn't happened yet. Not one iota, not one dot shall pass from the law of Torah until all is accomplished. So heaven and earth is still here. We still have dots and tittles. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So we're talking about relaxing the commands that are in scripture, not man-made rabbinical commands, not hand-washing commands. We're talking about the re relaxing of the commandments that are made in scripture. Okay. If you're teaching people to do away with commands or relax commands, like don't keep the Sabbath, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them, the commands and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Least in Greek is smallest in mount in size and dignity very small um little okay short elas elacristos elacristos the smallest the least okay so that is goes with my my horse in the race, so to speak, is that we are here to be tried and tested so that we see what what the order of the kingdom, like Abba is, this is a job interview and Abba is deciding who's going to be in charge of what when the time comes to have his kingdom established here, right? So he's going to have different things for different people to do at that time, right? And so he's establishing um you know, and training us in that regard. That is my horse in the race at this time. Now, Ezekiel 44, as I was saying, has different commands that are different from Leviticus. And now a lot of people try to twist this and try to make it organize it and try to fit it into Leviticus. My theory is, and this is just my own personal theory, that this this is not a this is not the same temple. Obviously, the temple design is not exactly the same as Leviticus. Um, therefore, there's some changes. Just like there was changes when Yeshua came, because Yeshua is our high priest through Melchizedek priesthood, right? There's some changes in that allow him to be our high priest. There's some changes in the command the law change in the law in the way that he could be our high priest because he's not um, a Levitical priest, but he is the Melchizedek high priest, the heavenly high priest. Therefore, this Ezekiel temple, if it is a different type of temple, could have different um, commands. And we'll see that as we go through. And I'm just going to point out a couple things to you as we go through, just some of my thoughts. And you do not have to accept my thoughts. I'm just telling you my thoughts because you're here with me. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me, shall come near to me to minister to me. And they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, declares the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall approach my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. When they enter the gates of the inner court, they shall wear linen garments. They shall have nothing of wool on them, while they minister at the gates of the inner court and within. They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen undergarments around their waists. They shall not bind themselves with anything that causes sweat. And when they go out into the outer court to the people, they shall put off the garments in which they have been ministering and lay them in the holy chambers. And they shall put on other garments, lest they transmit holiness to the people with their garments. They shall not shave their heads or let their locks grow long. They shall surely trim the hair of their heads. 
No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. They shall not marry a widow or a divorced woman, but only virgins of the offspring of the house of Israel, or a widow who is the widow of a priest. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. In a dispute they shall act as judges, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes and all my appointed feasts, and they shall keep my Sabbaths holy. They shall not defile themselves by going near to a dead person. However, for father or mother, for son or daughter, for brother or unmarried sister, they may defile themselves. After he has become clean, they shall count seven days for him. And on the day that he goes into the holy place, into the inner court, to minister in the holy place, he shall offer his sin offering, declares the Lord God. This shall be their inheritance. I am their inheritance, and you shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. They shall eat the grain offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering, and every devoted thing in Israel shall be theirs. And the first of all the first fruits of all kinds, and every offering of all kinds from all your offerings, shall belong to the priests. You shall also give to the priests the first of your dough, that a blessing may rest on your house. The priests shall not eat of anything, whether bird or beast, that has died of itself or is torn by wild animals. Okay, we're going to get into just a couple more of my theories. You can take them or leave them. These are my theories. Mine alone. I'm not saying thus says Yehovah. Okay. I'm just saying these are my theories. Okay. I have a theory that the linen garments is a picture. So the priesthood, this holy priesthood who has been given charge of the future sanctuary. Remember that Yeshua said he's, he's making a royal priesthood, right? I have a theory that they are wearing spiritual linen garments. The linen represents a spiritual covering, whereas the wool represents a fleshly covering. Um, and this is kind of a thread that goes throughout scripture. So you see them have linen garments while they're working in the temple, right? They're wearing their linen garments, their spiritual garments. And then they change as they leave the temple into woolen. So if they're leaving the temple, they change into wool garments. So I have this theory. This is just a theory, you guys. Don't stitch this and record it and make weird videos. Just my, just my random thoughts. I have this theory that they are in spiritual bodies, just like Yeshua was able to go back and forth. They're in spiritual bodies when they have when they're working in the garment and they're doing the offerings and they're wearing their linen garments their spiritual garments but when they leave the temple they they're able to put on fleshly human looking garments i have that's just a theory i have because yeshua as far as i understand he was able to go he was able to show himself in his spiritual body and then he was able to show himself in a fleshly body that's why he ate um food when he was interacting right after he had been risen from the dead this is my theory. So these Zadok priests, from the, they are the ones that are going to be, I think this is probably Philadelphia. This is just my theory. Again, these are just my theories. I think this is probably Philadelphia um, who has been anointed to be the pillars of New Jerusalem, right? And they have the ability. So Philadelphia, the brotherly priesthood has the endurance of the saints. They have this heart that is broken um, in ministry for the people. And they're, 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 that group, that church of Philadelphia lines up with the Feast of Yom Kippur, right? So it, so let me just show you. Since we've talked about feasts a little bit today, there's just so much to go through. I just don't even know when to stop sometimes. Uh, here we go. Let me show you. This is in the the spring. This is in the spring feast planner. If you want all of this, okay. 
So seven spirits, yeah. Seven, seven branches on the, men the menorah, the lampstand made of pure gold, right? Then you have the seven churches. So these churches, so these spirits line up with these churches, line up with these seven feasts, okay? And I go through this in the Passover planner. So if you want it, uh, just go download it, right? Ephesus, Passover, okay? Now, when you get, and I go through, the, I go through the reasoning for all of this in, in the book, okay? But we're not gonna go through that today. So Philadelphia, notice how these colors get hotter. So fire burns at, fire burns at a low heat here. And then this is the hottest heat. So the, the flames actually change color as the flame gets hotter, except for this one, sulfur. The green flame is sulfur being burnt out, interestingly enough. It doesn't, it's not a temperature thing. This middle one isn't the temperature thing. It's the sulfur being burnt out, burnt, burnt up. Now, this is the hottest flame. These are the hottest flames here, right? So you have Yom Kippur and then Tabernacles, the wedding feast, right? This lines up with fear of Yahovah. Laodicea thinks they're good. They think they're rich. They have zero fear of Yahovah. They don't have any reverence. I see it in my comments all day long. Zero reverence. Okay. Philadelphia lands on Yom Kippur, right? They are the, they are the royal priesthood, I think. I think they're the royal priesthood. These guys get spit out because they're not hot enough. They got to go get heat, heated up. So they got to go through refining fire through the tribulation to get heated up. But Philadelphia will stay in and get heated up into Sukkot, right? Make sense? So that is why I think Philadelphia is likely the royal priesthood. You can agree or disagree, that's fine. I'm open to other revelations on that, of course. All right, let's go to what else we're gonna look at today. Uh, I wanna just go over this really quick as well. This shall be their inheritance. I am their inheritance and you shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. They shall eat of the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering and every devoted thing in Israel shall be theirs and uh, the first of the first fruits of all kinds and every offering of all kinds from all your offerings and you shall be shall belong to the priest and you shall give to the priest the first of your dough. I love this because what do we call money? What do we call money now? Dough, right? You got that dough, right? So you give, so we don't have dough anymore that we make dough and then we would bring a bread offering to the priest, but you would give them your dough right? You would be like, okay, this person is a priest and they are doing the work of Yehovah. I give them some of my dough, right? Get it? It's kind of cool. It's amazing how culture has picked that up and they don't even realize that they've picked it up. And maybe they know, I don't know, but it's, it's just amazing how the meticulousness of all these things, right? So that a blessing may rest on your house. The priest shall not eat of anything, whether bird or beast that has died of itself or torn by well ends. So this idea is that the priests will not have land. They're not gonna have a business. They're not gonna have things because their work that they are doing is in ministry. It's in the, it's to minister to the people, to feed the bread to the people, the bread of the word, and to, and to bless the most high and glorify his name. That is their job. That is their vocation, right? So they're not supposed to be out there trying to farm a field at the same time, right? Their inheritance, the land that they're going to till is the land of New Jerusalem. They are the pillars of New Jerusalem. They are tilling that land, right? And that's why they eat of whatever the people bring in, whatever the offerings are, okay? Matthew 26, let's go there. Matthew 26, I hate reading. So they give us smaller portions for the Torah portions. I hate doing that. So I'm gonna go to Matthew 26 and we'll read the whole thing or most of it. We don't need Greek. I just don't like, 
I just don't like taking small parts out. It just doesn't seem right to me. We have the time. It's the Sabbath day. We can sit here and read it all, right? Let's, let's read all of Matthew 26. Then Yeshua had finished all these sayings. What sayings? Yeah, we should go back. We're going to have to go to Matthew 25. Yeah, let's go back. I have to read all of Matthew 25. Maybe. Yep. <laughs> all right. Math, all of Matthew 25 actually makes sense, but we're going to go back even further. Yep. Matthew 24. I think we should review all of this because I think it's really. Yeah, this is really time relevant. So let's go back to the beginning of Matthew 24. Jeepers. Okay. Uh, Matthew 24. Yeshua left the temple and was going away and his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them. You see, you see these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be one left here. There will not be left here one stone uh, upon another that will not be thrown down. And he sat on Mount Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Yeshua answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in his name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Is this going on right now? Yes. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Check. You will see that you are not alarmed. Check. Uh, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Getting there. And there will be famines and earthquakes. Getting there. In various places. But these are the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Still not quite there yet. Um, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Definitely happening this past week. I've seen so much of this. Oh boy. Uh, and because lawlessness, lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Check, we're there. Uh, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed uh, throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, but by, but by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, so this is based in Judea. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down and take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back and take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant in those days, in for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. So he's saying that there will be a Sabbath in the future. Sabbath's not done away with. And then there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now, nor will ever be. Have we had a great tribulation that has not been from the beginning of the world until now? Have we already had that? 
the entire world had great tribulation in that way. I don't think so. Some people are saying that it's already happened, but we haven't had a great worldwide tribulation yet. As far as I know, if I'm wrong, please message me and correct me. And if those days had not been cut short, no human would be saved. Have we had such a time that if the days had not been cut short, no human would be saved? I don't think so. So these preterist doctrines that are going out, they're not reading their scriptures. They're just that preterism stuff, you guys, that's going around. It's, it's exactly what I said in the beginning of this study. It's people watching a YouTube video and saying, oh, that sounds right. That sounds good. That sounds convincing. And then they're taking that YouTube video and they're shortening up the ideas. And then they're posting it on TikTok and acting like they got a revelation from Yehovah when they did not sit down and read his scriptures and go through line by line, looking at his scriptures and seeing where the contradictions were. That is why you, that's why you get these doctrines is because people are not sitting down and doing this like we are doing every week, right? So that preterist doctrine, like just in reading this little bit, we can un, we can unwind it, right? Has there been a great tribulation such as not been seen in the beginning of the world until now, nor will never be. The beginning of the end, the birth of the kingdom will not happen until we see that great tribulation where if they are, it's not cut short, no human would be saved. We have not seen that to my knowledge yet. For the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arrive, arise and perform great signs and wonders, so to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, so that if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. And if they say to you, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines from the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? Has this happened? Has, has this happened? I, I don't think so. I don't know that it has happened. So I don't think this has happened yet. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the sending, coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, the vultures will gather. That is a reference back to Isaiah and to Genesis, by the way the corpse and the vultures. Um, if you look at the Abraham, when Abraham's cutting the pieces, you will see in Genesis, when Abraham's cutting the pieces, the, the vultures are gathering there. That is the, the Valley of Armageddon, right? So that is where we will see the final battle in the, the Valley of Armageddon, okay? So when he's saying wherever the corpse is there, the vultures will gather, that's, if you go back into Genesis, you'll see that Abraham was cutting the pieces for the covenant, right? He put the two pieces on each side and then the, the smoking, the burning torch and the smoking oven walked through. Abraham had a sleep fall upon him. At, during that section, you will see the corpses and you will see the vultures gathering. So this is pointing you to where this event will take pl place, which is the Valley of Decision, um, the, the Valley of Decision which is the Armageddon Valley, right? You can look that all up. We've gone through it before, if you've been with me for a while. Immediately after the tribulation, those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give his light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, oops. This is... Then will appear... Where was I? Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, uh, from one end of the earth to the other. Let's go to Ezra's. Second Ezra's. One sec. I'll grab it. Sorry, my desk is kind of small. <laughs> you all fell off the desk. Okay, second Ezra's. Mm. 
you go to chapter 12 in second Ezra, um, probably read all of that. I'm just going to start just so because my voice is getting tired. I'm just going to start at verse 22 in chapter 12 of second Ezra. Um, and whereas you saw three heads resting there, this is the interpretation. In the last days there there will the in last in the last days will the most high raise up three kingdoms and renew many things on the earth therein, and there will there will bear rule over the earth and the, over those who dwell therein with much oppression. Above all those that were before them, uh, above all those that were before them. Therefore, they are called the heads of the eagle. So basically just oppressive rulers, okay? Uh, and those, those, for these are those who will accomplish her wickedness and they will finish her last end. And whereas you saw the great head appear to me, it signifies that one of them will die upon his bed and yet with great pain. It signifies that one of them will die upon his bed yet with great pain. I wonder if that's Charles, Prince Charles, King Charles. But to that, but... But for the two that remain, the sword will devour them. So there'll be three leaders uh, risen above all the rest. One will die in his bed with great pain. And then two more will die with the sword through warfare, sword and warfare. Okay. But the two that remaineth, the sword will devour them. For the sword of one of will devour him that was with him and also fall by the sword in the last days. Whereas you saw two under wings passing overhead to be on the right side. This is the interpretation. Um, these are they whom the Most High has kept to His end. This is a small. This this is the small kingdom full of trouble that you saw, and the lion whom you saw rising up out of the wood, roaring and speaking to the eagle and rebuking her for her unrighteousness, and her words which you have heard. This is the Anointed One whom the Most High has kept to the end of days, who will spring up out of the seed of David, and he will come and speak to them and reprove them for their wickedness, so the sword of his mouth and righteousness, and will heap up before them their contemptuous dealings. And for he, for at the first, he will set them alive in his judgment. When he has reproved them, he will destroy them. So when Yeshua is talking about coming at, coming with the sword of his mouth, um, this he this is this is part of that understanding for the rest of my people he will deliver with mercy those that have been preserved throughout the borders he will make them joyful until the coming of the end and even the day of judgment whereas i have spoken to you from the beginning this is the dream that you saw and the interpretation thereof and you have been chosen to know the secret of the most high Therefore, write these things down that you've seen in a book and put them in a secret place and you will teach them to the wise of your people whose hearts, uh, whose hearts you know are able to comprehend and keep these secrets. But wait here yourself for seven days more that, there may, that it may be shown to you whatever it is that pleases the most high to show you. Okay. Just want to see if... Yeah, here we go. Okay, chapter 13. So I would definitely suggest reading all of chapter 12 and then 13. And then it came to pass seven days after I dreamed a dream and behold, there arose a wind from the sea and it moved all the waves thereof. And I saw and behold, the wind causes caused to come up in the midst of the sea and as it were a likeness of a man. And I saw behold that a man flew with the clouds of heaven. And when he turned his countenance to look, all the things trembled that were seen under him and wherever the voice went out of his mouth, they burned, they burned that heard his voice as like wax melts when it feels the fire. And after this, I saw and behold, there was a gathering together of a multitude of men out of number from the four winds of heaven to make war against the man that came out of the sea. And I saw that, behold, he carved himself a great mountain and flew upon it. And, but I saw, but I sought to see the region or the place where the mountain was graven, and I could not. After I saw this, behold, they all, they that were gathered together to fight against him were sore afraid, yet dared fight. So they're all be gathered to fight. And behold, 
As he saw the assault of the multitude that came, he neither lifted his hand nor held a spear nor any instrument of war. But only I saw how he sent out of his mouth and it had been a flood of fire and out of his lips flaming breath and out of his tongue he cast out sparks. He cast out sparks of the storm. And these were all mixed together and the flood of fire, the flaming breath and the great storm fell upon the assault of the multitude, which was prepared to fight and burned all of them up. So that, so that upon a sudden and innumerable multitude, so that upon a sudden of an innumerable multitude was nothing, uh, multitude, nothing was to be perceived, but only dust of ashes and the smell of smoke. And when I saw this, I was amazed. But afterwards, I saw the same man come down from the mountain and call to him another multitude, which was peaceful. And many people came to him, where, whereof some were glad, some were sorry, and some of them were bound. And some, of, some were brought of those who were offered. And, and through great fear, then through great fear, I awakened and prayed to the Most High and said, You have showed your servants these wonders from the beginning, and you've counted me worthy that you should receive my prayer. Okay, so just another picture of this possible battle. So if you want to dig into that, um, second Ezra's, uh, that was 12 and 13. There's plenty more on there. It's such a good book. I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. So good. Okay. Let's go back. Immediately after the tribulation of the days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give it its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the earth will be shaken. Then will appear uh, in heaven the sighing of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and call, trumpet call, and gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn this lesson. As soon as this branch branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves you know that summer is near you all so also when you see all these things you know that he is near at the very gates truly i say to you this generation will not pass until all these things take place heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away concerning that day or hour no one knows not even the angels of heaven nor the son uh, but the father only for as for as they were in the days of Noah, so will be in the coming, uh, be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days of the, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be in, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. I feel like we're very much, probably that time is starting to come upon us because I do notice that there are there's some of us that are very much aware of what's going on in the world and the time that it is and there's very there's a lot of others that have they're just oblivious and you try to show them and you try to talk to them about it and they're just so oblivious right they don't even speak the same language as you anymore uh I, that is this picture there's those of us that are building our arcs preparing our lamps getting ready and making sure um, getting our garments correct, right? And then there's others that are just not a care in the world, right? Two men will that will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. So that word in Greek is para para lambano para lambano taken para lambano to take to one side to take to receive to oneself just fyi therefore stay awake you do not know what hour your lord is coming but know this if the master of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming he would have stayed awake and would have not let his house get broken into therefore you must be ready uh ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them food in the proper time? Remember how we're talking about how the priest would serve the bread? So they were serving the bread of God to the people, right? 
That's why these pictures go throughout scripture. So who is the faithful and wise, ser wise servant who the master sets over his household to give them food, feed them the bread, the word at the proper time, at the proper moed, right? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing, uh, find doing, find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. Back to my theory. My theory is the, the, the things that we are faithful with now, he will set us over more in the future, right? But if the wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he does not know. And he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in a place, then that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When we were talking at the beginning of this uh, study, we were talking about how to spot how to spot um, people that you should you could listen to versus how to spot people that maybe you want to just stay away from. And another way that you can do this is to watch who is feeding bread and who is just spending time beating fellow servants. Okay. Especially in the earlier days of TikTok, it was a very popular thing in the Christian community to stitch each other and try to make each other look stupid. Um, and, or to, you know, constantly just be trying to beat the other servants because you disagree with them in one small way or one big way. And it was kind of turning into this really tacky back and forth. And this, this lasted for quite a few years. I don't know if you guys were, were there in the beginning, that was like 2020, it was really, really bad. So one thing that you could watch for is if someone is, if their heart is to feed you bread, right? To, to get everybody a good meal of the proper bread, or is their heart to just beat down the other servants, to, you know, wear them out, to constantly be nitpicking in the comments you see this all the time in the comments people like oh you said this word wrong and you should say this instead and being very very like endlessly nitpicky right in the comments that is another way that you can tell right are they feeding or are they trying to destroy we do have to call out bad doctrine at times but there's a way that you go about that in a proper way. One thing that I kind of have decided for myself is that if somebody wants to stitch me constantly, but they won't sit down and have a formal debate and discuss the matter, or they won't come to me in private and discuss the matter first, but they just want to do the back and forth stitch, it's likely that they're just trying to, just trying to be divisive. They don't actually want to seek the truth or seek the reality of the matter or sift through it. They just want to be divisive and they just want to kind of elevate themselves, right? So they're trying to cut other people down. They're trying to make other people look stupid so that they can elevate themselves, right? I hope that makes sense. This is another way that you can decide and have discernment about, about whose food you're going to eat, right? Are you going to eat what these people are feeding you? Matthew 25, 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they had no oil in them. And when the wise took flasks of oil, the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And the bridegroom was delayed. So they all became drowsy and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps have gone out. But the wise were saying, since there's not enough oil for us and for you, buy, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him and to the marriage feast. And then the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the day or the hour. I don't think I have to go because we already kind of went through that. I don't think I have to go through it again. 
Um, it's very important, like we've been discussing through this whole study, to learn how to press oil. Even if you're reading the word and you don't necessarily understand all of it, it's not really clicking yet, it's okay. Just keep reading, it'll eventually start to sort out, okay? It takes a little bit. A couple of years ago, I didn't understand a lick of Isaiah. I would read Isaiah and it would make no sense to me. It was just, but now I understand it, okay? So most of it, some of it. I'm not gonna say I understand it all because that's, you know, that would be a bold statement. Even if it's better to sit there and read word by word and just do your best to try to start to understand, pray and ask him for understanding. It's better to press oil that way than scrolling, trying to press. This is not pressing oil, okay? Um, scrolling through short videos from a random people who you don't know is not pressing oil, okay? Prayer, read a verse, ask him ask him to show you ask him to reveal it to you spend a lot of time going through verses and reading through that is pressing oil okay keep the feasts and festivals they sanctify you that is pressing oil his sabbaths sanctify you because he is the lord who sanctifies you he is jehovah who sanctifies you keep his sabbaths because they will sanctify you because as you go through that process, you're pressing oil, yeah? The foolish virgins are going out trying to find somebody to buy oil from, a dealer. Give me that quick dose of oil, right? I made a scroll until I get that quick little dose of oil. That's not pressing oil, right? You, you're not going to be able to buy it at the last minute. You have, that's why he gave us the Sabbath so that we would be constantly on track. And I'm sure some of you have noticed that those of you who keep the feasts and keep this, keep this, keep the moed is even if you have a time like a week where you've kind of gotten lazy or you don't feel as close to him, that Sabbath will come around. The next Sabbath will come around and he'll draw you back in. Because you're being obedient, the obedience will draw you back in. It will keep you on track. You know that Shavuot is coming. So you're getting on track. You're counting the Omer to get on track. And it's keeping you on the path so that you're always not sitting there with an empty lamp, right? And that's what the feasts do is they make sure that you're on track seasonally all year round, right? Matthew 25, 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called to his servants and entrusted them, trusted to them his property. So the first one he gave five talents to another one, uh, to another two, according each according to his ability. And then he went away. And he, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded them and made five talents more. And so he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, well, good, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, and he also who had the two talents came forward saying, master, you have delivered me to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enjoy the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had received one talent came forward saying, master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But the mat master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where, gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent so take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10 talents. For everyone who has been, who, 
Everyone who has will be given, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from whom? But from whom? But from the one who was has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne before him, will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate the people one from another as a sheep she separates the sheep from the goats, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goat on, goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous answered him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you uh, and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when he did, when did, and when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe him, clothe you? And when did we see you sick? or in prison and visit you. And the king answered them, truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. The red letters are actually kind of hard to read. <laughs> my eyes are... <laughs> Matthew 25, 41. And then he will say to those on his left, goats are on the left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they will also say, Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then they will answer him saying, he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, you did not do it to the least to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Matthew 26, 1. And when Yeshua had finished these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the son of man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief Chief priests and the elders and the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, 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 and plotted together in order to arrest Yeshua by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, when Yeshua was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster flask of expensive, of expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at a table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For, we could have been, for it could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Yeshua, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me, for you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this, uh, this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelves, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to, to betray him. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Yeshua saying, where will you give us, uh, where will you have us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city uh, to a certain man saying to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand and I will keep the Passover at my house, at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Yeshua directed them and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he reclined at the table with the 12 and they were eating. And he said, truly, I say, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and they were beginning to say to him, they're beginning to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? And he answered, it is the one who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. And the son of man go, the son of man goes, as it is written of him, uh, woe to that man whom the son of man is betrayed. And it would be better if that man had not been born. Judas 
who would betray him say, uh, answered, is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, you have said so. Okay, no, notice this, notice this. Um, what did the other disciples say, say? And they were very sorrowful and they began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord, Lord, master, the one who is over me, the master, okay? That's what the other disciples said, right? What does Judas say? Is it I, rabbi, teacher? So there's Lord. He's Lord of your life. You know, he's master. He's your husband. Uh, he's your leader. You walk as he walked. You listen to him. He's Lord. Or is he a teacher like every other teacher, right? That's the difference, right? He said to, to him, you have said so. Uh, Matthew 26, 26. And now they're eating. Yeshua took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take this, eat. This is my body. And he took um, a cup. And when it was and when he had given thanks, he gave it to him, saying, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine um, until that day when I drink of it new with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung a, sim, uh, sung a hymn, they went up to the Mount of Olives and Yeshua said to them, uh, you will all fall away because of me this night. It is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered him, uh, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Yeshua said to him, truly, I tell you this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. <laughs> then Yeshua went, to, went with them to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane. I can't say that. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebi, he, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, uh, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then he came to his disciples, uh, when he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me an hour, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I think this is a good message for us right now, too, because as we get tired and we get worn out during these times, we tend to get sleepier, we tend to get, we're sleeping on the job and we so we have to watch and pray that we don't enter into temptation because even though our spirits are willing, we fall into that fleshly weakness so much, right? I think this is a very good instruction for this hour that we are in now. And for the second time, he went and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the words again. And then he came to the disciples uh, and said to them, sleep and take care of your rest later on. See the hours at hand that the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us go. Let us be, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, with him, and a great crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss uh, is the man. Seize him. And they came up, and then he came up to Yeshua at once, saying, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Yeshua said to him, Friend, do what you have come to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Yeshua and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Yeshua, one of those who were with Yeshua stretched out his arm and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Yeshua said to him, "Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword, uh, who, for all who take the sword, will perish by the sword." Remember this in the future. Do not think that I. Do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how 
then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so. And at that hour, Yeshua said to the crowds, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day by day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all of this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And the disciples left him and fled. Then those who had seized Yeshua led him to uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. And now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Yeshua that he, they may put him to death. And they found none, though many, though many false witnesses had come forward. At the last, at last two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of Yehovah and rebuild it in three days. And the priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? But Yeshua remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living Elohim, tell us that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Yeshua said to him, you have said, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming from the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he is utter blasphemy. What further witnesses do you need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And then they answered, he deserves death. And then they spit on his face and struck him. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Okay, uh, let's just... One more. Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard, and his and a servant girl came up to him and said, uh, "You were also with Yeshua the Galilean." But he denied it before them, saying, "I do not know what you mean." And they went out to the entrance. Another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, "This man is Yeshua of Nazareth." And then he denied. This man was with Yeshua of Nazareth, and then he denied it again with an oath, "I do not know the man." After that, after a while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them for your accent betrays you. And then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed and Peter remembered the saying of Yeshua before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So he invoked a curse on himself and swore that he did not know Yeshua. Uh, let's stop there. I wanted to go through, because we never went through this before, uh, I wanted to go through the different... So in Ezekiel, we talked about the Zadoks and the Zadok priesthood. So the Zadoks had kept uh, pure and they had not gone astray. Okay. What is interesting is if you look up pre-Herod, okay, so there's two understandings of the Sadducees, okay? The original Sadducees pre-Herod, okay? So pre-Herod, second temple Herod. There's a lot of Herods. I'll show you the... Um, Okay, if you look at the different Herods, there's a lot of different Herods, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So, as you go back, there's many Herods, and then they become Herod the Great, right? These are all different Herod the Greats, okay? And this is their descendants, and this is their this is their brothers and sisters, and all of that. Okay. So second temple time, we had this Herod the Great. Okay. This is the Herod the Great. He was married to this lady. This lady 
her dad was the high priest. Okay, so this is the intermarriage of Rome and Judah at this moment, okay? There was a group of Sadducees at this time who were just keeping the commands. This was before the oral traditions and the rabbinical uh, houses had started to be established, okay? So you have this intermarriage happening, and then this obviously had an influence over what was going on in Jerusalem, okay? So at that time, you had these, this group of Sadducees, and they were keeping just the commandments, and they were preserving the ways of Yehovah. They did not keep the oral traditions and all of that that you see today, like I was showing you before with the hand washing and all the different things, okay? It was at this time that this started to get altered, okay? This is just on wiki. Here, here are the great lineages. Um, so it was at this time during the second temple period that you start to get things watered down. You start to get the commandments watered down with traditions of men in a greater way, okay? Before this, there was a lot more, the Sadducees had a lot more of a pure kind of way. So these are actually, the Sadducees of Yeshua's time were actually called, I think it's Botharians, Botharians? Yeah, Botharians. So obviously, where did they get this? Bothusians. So obviously, where did they get this name to be the Bothusians? Right? A Jewish sect closely to related, related to, if not a development of the Sadducees. Okay. The Bothusians were developed from that marriage. And then that's when you started to see the temple and all this stuff going in the temple start to get skewed. Okay. And you start to see all this other stuff. And so this is, you could look this up and go through it. And I just want to kind of give you a quick breakdown so you know where to look, right? Okay. Um, when we were talking about Ezekiel 44, Ezekiel almost didn't make the cut into the Torah. Okay. I'm looking at the Talmud here. This is the Talmud. And I'm just showing you this so you know why Ezekiel didn't quite make it into the Torah or the Tanakh. I'm sorry, not the Torah, the Tanakh. Okay, so this is uh, Rav Yehuda. And this is, um, if you want to look this up, it is Talmud. You look up Talmud Shabbat 13b. Talmud Shabbat 13b. The Talmud is commentary on the scriptures, okay? That's why you can understand what the Talmud is. I kind of look at, and, and I know I have friends that would probably hate me saying this. I kind of look at the Talmud like I would look at a Christian bookstore, right? If you go into a Christian bookstore, you're going to have Joel Olstein's point of view on the scriptures, and you're going to have this guy's point of view on the scriptures and that guy, and it's all going to be in a Christian bookstore, and you can pick and choose whose point of view you want to listen to. Um, it doesn't mean that their point of view is good. It's just, it's recorded, okay? They wrote a book, it's recorded. The Talmud is all the different points of view of many different rabbis. Um, yeah, it's, I'm showing you this for, so that you understand that there was a conversation had that the book of Ezekiel should not be included in the, Tan the Tanakh because, like we were discussing earlier, like we were discussing earlier, uh, there's contradictions between Ezekiel and, and who the priests are allowed to marry in Ezekiel and who the priests are allowed to marry in Leviticus. They're contradictions. I don't believe they're contradictions. I believe they're different temple standards because they're completely different temple um, revelations. I think that the Ezekiel temple is going to be the heavenly temple come to earth. Um, and that's why the standards are going to be different. Okay. Anyways, Rav Yehuda said that, uh, that the Rav said, truly the man is to remember, uh, is remembered for good. And his name is 
I'm not going to try to say that, Henya ben Hizika. And if not for him, the book of Ezekiel would have been suppressed because of its contents in many details contradict the matters of Torah. So like I was showing you that Ezekiel 44 contradicts what is said in Leviticus, okay? They have different rules for the priesthood in Ezekiel than they do in Leviticus. The sages sought to suppress the book and exclude it from the canon. What did he, Henya, Henya ben Hezekiah do? They brought him three jugs of oil, four light, and food up to his upper story, and he sat isolated in the upper story, and he did not move uh, from there until he homiletically interpreted all of the verses in the book of Ezekiel that seemed contradictory and resolved the contradictions. So what is he saying? This one rev, rabbi, sat up all night, so the oil is for the light, because they had lamps, right? You had lamps with oil and with food. And he just sat there and he sat isolated until he worked out and interpreted all the, all the, all the contradictions so that the book of Ezekiel could stay in the Tanakh, okay? So the, his book of Ezekiel was this close, this close from not being in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, yeah? Does that make sense? Okay, so we have the Sadducees, and then we have, so the old school of the Sadducees, pre-Herod, just kept the commands of Yah, okay? They did not have all the rabbinical, the rabbinical stuff started in about 150 BC. That's when you start to see the rabbinical stuff really amping up, okay? Then from that is born the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai, Okay. And you also have this picture of the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai. Okay, let me just move myself. Um, they have they have two houses with two rulings on the on the different aspects of Jewish law, and they basically they have about three hundred ways I think that they disagree, um, and they they don't agree on everything. And so this started to come about from about one hundred and fifty BC onward. Okay. I am showing you this so that you have a background of what Yeshua is talking about when he's talking to Sadducees and Pharisees and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The Sadducees of Yeshua's time were not the Zadok level Sadducees that were pre Herod the Great, Second Temple, pre Bethusalus. Uh, Bethusalian Sadducees, okay? So the, the, the Sadducees of Yeshua's time or the Bethusalian Sadducees, they had already been mixed with the Rome, the Roman stuff, and had already been kind of corrupted, okay? Does that make sense? So you start to see that kind of, I'm not telling you this so that you can go follow Sadducees or uh, I'm hoping that you guys are picking up why I'm, I'm just explaining to you the history and the context so that you understand when Yeshua is talking to different groups of people, what he's talking about, okay? So Hillel and Shmai ended up being the two main um, groups of, I think they're called Pharisees though, later on. Yeshua, what's interesting though, is Yeshua mostly hung out with the Pharisees. The fact that he is talking to Pharisees all the time and discussing the scriptures with Pharisees all the time, it actually shows you that he was discussing the scriptures with the Pharisees a lot. And, and this is a very Jewish thing to do is to go back and forth and discuss the different aspects of the commandments and do the different opinions. And that is a very Jewish thing to do. Christians, on the other hand, can't handle that. Um, they get very triggered often by if you're trying to discuss the different aspects, um, they get a, they get a little triggered by it, honestly. Um, and I think the reason that they get very i think like i'm talking modern like very modern kind of lukewarm christians i think the reason that they get very unstable when you go to talk about some of the deeper issues is because they don't have a good root right trees that don't have a good rooting are easily un made unstable they're easily blown by every wind of doctrine and so people that don't know the scriptures really well get very reactive when you possibly suggest that we could be keeping the feasts and festivals and that we should be keeping the sabbath they get very reactive because, reactive because 
their knowledge of scripture is so shallow that they're they're unstable right when you grow deep roots roots through study through going through all this stuff through learning these different things and you study and you do that time as you grow deep roots you become very strong and rooted and if somebody comes up to you and says this or that and it's not exactly what you believe you're able to look at it without becoming unstable right so when you run into people who are freaking out because they believe in the trinity and you don't or they don't think that they think you know all foods are clean and you know better and they become kind of unstable in their dealings with you it is a sign that they actually don't have really deep roots right um, people with deep roots who have done the time and the research and the due diligence they don't get unstable very easily and this works in every aspect of life it works in every aspect of life right uh what else was i going to tell you i think that's all we can cover for today i think i'll leave it there uh, I'm not sure if uh, Sheepdog is on. I'm just going to stop the recording. Kind of losing my voice at this point.